Sarah Obadwe here from Horse Racing Nation, joined once again by Matthew DeSantis at the handle at Failed to Menace is where you can find him on Twitter. And this time last year, you and I were getting to chat for the very first time talking about one of the races that we're going to be talking about today for this year's renewal. Matthew, thanks for joining me again. And what a year we have had. It is. It's hard to believe it's only been a year on one hand. And on another hand, it feels like it's been ages uh, since we did that first video together and a great way to celebrate, you know, knowing each other for a year in this regard and uh, a great race and excited to talk about this year's edition of the Comely because there's a certain horse that I think we're both excited to see return to the track. And so it's been a big year for both of us and excited for what 2023 is going to bring ahead as well. And before we get to wax poetically about one of our favorite horses, uh, we do have another race that we're going to be covering, another stakes race on that card that's coming up this Friday at Aqueduct, and that is the Grade 3 Long Island Stakes. Switching up kind of the, the dates of when some of these races are going to be running since last year was the Gio Ponte and then the Comley on the same day. But this year we have this Long Island and it's for those fillies and mares, the three-year-olds and up. We're going a mile and three-eighths on the turf. Aqueduct will be discontinuing their turf racing come Sunday. Rest the grass for the winter since it's obviously not feasible to run on it in New York at that time. And uh, we'll, we'll be experiencing a little bit of a lack of turf racing all over the place. Yeah. but a couple last ones to get in and we've got a field of six for this race going off as race number six you got three for chad brown you got three others what are your thoughts on this uh this compact but intriguing field we have here yeah i would agree it is an intriguing field there's a, a lot of horses that i think have been close in a lot of instances, uh, some horses that are stepping up in other instances. But yeah, it's it's an intriguing field. And you mentioned half the field is Chad Brown horses. Uh, I actually kind of went in the other direction. I went with the morning line favorite, uh, and that's Temple City Terror, which is the Brendan Walsh horse. I feel like that horse has actually been progressing nicely, uh, especially the last three times out has really shown, uh, I think, really strong form. It, it does feel like the only quirky thing about Temple City Terror is this horse does seem to like, like seem to like a mile and a half, a little bit more than a mile and three eighths. I do think there's some excuses for that. If you look back, some of those mile and three eighths races were on very soft ground. There is some rain forecasted for Friday at Aqueduct, but not enough, I think, to change those conditions that considerably. Uh, but I, I just I don't know about you, but personally, I was not overwhelmed by these three Chad Brown entries, and so I kind of had a hard time separating them from each other. And I. I you know, I kind of like Rocky Sky, I think probably the most out of the three. Uh, but ultimately, I kind of went with chalk with Temple City Tear, and I'd probably use Rocky Sky uh, a little bit as well, just to try to find a little bit of value because the other two Chad Browns are at such a low price. Yeah. And I mean, David made um, the five California Queen and the six Capital Structure, um, both five to two. So I I don't know that I've seen him often give them the same sort of consideration on the morning line when he has multiple entrants. It's usually kind of with these Chad Brown horses, when he has multiple entrants in a race, there's a clear cut one that is a mm -hmm. favorite over the other two and you might still get it wrong but you at least go into the race kind of all agreeing of who's the one to be and who's the one that needs to improve or or who might be kind of more of a surprise um, and sometimes you'll get the longest shot of his entrance winning such as in italian in the diana uh, when he had so many in there who then went on to uh to really improved quite a bit this year, but I don't think we're looking at any in Italians in this race unless somebody really improves significantly. And I'm with you on Rocky Sky as being the one that I don't know if she's going to be the best horse in this race. I think that is the number two Temple City Terror, but I think that she's going to get more of a jump on the pace situation yeah. in this race by sitting a little bit closer than some of these other horses that do want to come from a little further back. And that is my concern with Temple City Terror, because I do feel as though she got some decent pace last time out at Keeneland. And as we know, in New York, you have a frequent lack of early speed. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right that there is that frequent lack of early speed. And it is uh, one of those things where uh, I, I just I look at the other two uh, Chad Brown horses. And the other thing that just kind of, you know, I look at a horse like California Queen. This is a horse that's gone third, 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 second the last four times out. The only win was at an optional claimer, 80,000. 
I, I look at the same sort of structure or same <laughs> structure with same sort of uh, routine with capital structure where it's a lot of underneath finishes except for an optional claimer 62 win, an allowance win, a maiden win. And, and so it's just hard to see now stepping up into a grade three that they're going to suddenly perform a lot better. I also agree that uh, Rocky Sky should have that tactical speed to be able to sit close enough uh, to whatever speed exists. As you pointed out, it, it sometimes is a variable in New York. Uh, so we'll see who ends up setting the pace here. But uh, you know, I, I think Rocky Sky just has – consider a really nice trip. That Waya performance last time out I think was, was particularly noteworthy, made a little bit of an earlier move and was still able to hold off uh, the the other comers, one of which was capital structure. Um, and, and yeah, so I, I think that one makes a lot of sense. And again, Temple City Tear. Brendan Walsh, that's a barn that just runs so hot and cold for me. Uh, you know, when he's rolling, it feels like he's putting out a ton of turf winners. But there are times that Keeneland meet we, we just got done with. I think, you know, he, he won very little uh, at that meet. Uh, so, you know, he's, a, again, hot and cold. Right now, a little bit cold. Temple City Terror, like I said, I think is, is a very good horse. But, yeah, from a value standpoint, I think Rocky Sky presents the best option for people trying to find value in a six-horse turf race with three Chad Brown entrants. And speaking of some possible insane value, I think the horse that you're looking at that's probably just going to dead send from the rail is Big Time Lady, who, yeah. I mean, you're kind of looking at, well, why are you here? I mean, clearly doesn't really class up with a field like this and, and is 50 to 1 on the morning line, but Jose Gomez riding, so getting some weight break as well, uh, and that's not something that I consider very frequently and my handicapping is a variable that'll change my mind. But when it's a situation like this, where you have a horse that might be the only one on a lone lead going this distance and be able to get into a comfortable rhythm and have a little bit less weight on. Um, and she has been on the turf before, even though it's been a while, is this a situation where it's possible that nobody pressures her early and she just goes and that's it. It, it's very possible because there doesn't look to be anyone else who would pressure uh, this horse at all uh, in the field. And so, yeah, she she's absolutely going to be uh, the one that goes out. Now, the interesting thing is, I think, California Queen, if you look too back, she tried to wire the field at the EP Taylor up at Woodbine and fell short. Now, we're stretching out a little bit longer, so I would doubt that's going to be the same tactic, but she might be company up there. Uh, with the number one horse in this particular race. But we've seen that in New York turf racing and quite frankly, even on the dirt too, where, you know, somebody just gets out to an easy lead and that horse gets brave all of a sudden. That horse gets real confident and can wire the field. And I think this at a, at a huge price in a field where there's a lot of, uh, you know, other short prices there, not the worst idea to include a 50 to one shot on your, you know, vertical exotics, I think, and certainly uh, make it a little bit more profitable considering the race shape set up in this case. And in no other situation, if I had not been watching these kinds of races for so long, and this is honestly something that we talked about last year, and I, I rewatched that video the other day, and you were like, what have you noticed about any trends here at this track? And I was like, well, there's no speed on the turf. And it's still true. And it's been true for quite some time. So this is a horse that I at least have to consider um, as being able to hold off everybody else, especially at a, a crazy price like that, because if you're in front early, you are just at such a huge advantage. And we see riders come in from out of town that haven't adapted to this style of how races are run and, and mm -hmm. be aggressive early and be able to get um, the jump on the rest of the field and get some insane prices home, such as um, there was a 58 to one shot that won last week to close yeah. out the week. Um, and that pick six ended up paying out only to two tickets since there was a carryover going into that card. So I wonder a little bit, obviously, Jose Gomez is riding very regularly in New York, but I, I wonder if possibly uh, this could this could happen um, or she could at least end up yeah. finishing second or third and hitting the board in this short field of six. And if the longest shot in the field does that, I think that you're looking at a, a decent payout somewhere in there. I absolutely. Couldn't agree more. I, I think you're absolutely right about that. And, and the interesting part is 
you, you mentioned the out-of-town jockeys. I mean, this is something where it is distinct to New York that they, they just seem allergic to running any faster than 25.50 in the opening quarter and half on the turf. And and you watch other tracks, and I just have to always chuckle when I hear track announcers go, oh, they're crawling up front 48 in the opening half mile. I'm just thinking, yeah, I'd, you know, John Embrial or Chris Griffin would have an aneurysm if anybody ran 48 seconds in the opening half mile on turf up in New York. So uh, it, it's just... It, it's a, the nature of that. I, they like running that way. I don't completely understand why. I think particularly if you have a horse that has speed. I understand if there's just no pace in the race and nobody really wants to go to the lead. I get it. But when there's a when there's a speed horse and they just choke out these really slow fractions, it's just frustrating because you're taking away the horse's best ability, which is to be fast. Uh, and you're just making them be slow and you're bringing the rest of the field into the consideration. So hopefully Gomez just kind of looks at the PPs the way that we did and goes, listen, let's just go and get out there and be clear of everybody by, you know, several lengths and just have fun out there today and let the horse just go and feel good about itself. Well, that's the hope. This one's definitely going to be on some tickets for me, um, but Rocky Sky will be as well. I'm going to try to beat Temple City Terror, but I certainly won't be surprised if she gets the job done. Anybody else that you want to give a mention in here? No, I think we pretty much so covered the field, but I will say before we transition to the next race, uh, as you can tell, for those of you who watch my videos or watch me with Sarah sometimes, I have a different backdrop because I am like many of you traveling for the holidays and I am here with my family. And so in Greenville, South Carolina, and I'm with the man who introduced me to horse racing. And that is my dad, Blaine DeSantis. So Hello. dad wanted to have him kind of come in and give some thoughts uh, on the sixth and seventh that race as right. well. So, well, I, I didn't deliberately block anyone on Twitter. I just want <laughs> you all to know that you can't block 23,000 people deliberately. It's an impossibility, but I don't know what happened. I don't, Anyway, I don't, you know, I agree. Rocky Sky is the one. Don't you? That's the horse. I, that's it. I'm, if I was doing this podcast, we'd be done in three minutes. Okay. Rocky <laughs> Sky. Where am I at? Here I am. There you go. Lord, so, I gotta go. Now, who do you like in the next race? Oh, though? well, now the next race. Now, the next race is a fun race. Okay. Now, I know. I know. I like, I like 63 caliber, the number two horse. I like that horse a lot. But do not, don't, do not sit on. Pistol is a blazing. I like Pistol is a blazing. I see some things I like. And all I can say is midweek Gulfstream Park, I said the same thing about Paco's Pico. And go back and look. And Paco's Pico was the win. There you go. Yep. Uh, it was the winner. And, yeah. uh, you know, I don't know. You guys go to so much detail compared to me. I just take a, a good time. And, you know, but I do like those first one and two horses in the next race. Hey, you guys doing a great job. I'm going to get out of here. There's, we got to get ready. Cooking's got to happen here. We got Christmas stuff behind us. We're having a Christmassy Thanksgiving. <laughs> Happy holidays to you, Sarah. <laughs> So great to have you on and share some wisdom. And, and that's great that you can bring him on to uh, be the person that introduced you to this game and get, yeah. some, get some thoughts. And, and uh, dad's giving out some prices in the next race. I love it. <laughs> that, and he's usually a chalk player too. And that's the, <laughs> that's the surprising part. So when he gives out prices, you know, pay attention because it doesn't happen often. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, but, but now this it. is the race of course, that uh, features the return of, one of our favorite horses, uh, Kathleen. Absolutely. Out. So <laughs> I know. I mean, how much time are we going to spend um, discussing all of her merits and, and uh, discussing our uh, our fan club base that we have for this horse? Um, and I, I had to kind of temper myself a little bit going into this preview because I asked you to, re to record these races with me before we knew that she was going yeah. to be a part of the field. And then once we found out that she was, I was like, oh, well, this is just perfect because uh, <laughs> because we are both very much so in love with Kathleen O. But there's other horses in here in this yeah. eight horse field that we have for the Cumley. Um, and we're, we're going a mile and an eighth. And this is one of the last races, I think, that is restricted to these three year old fillies for the end of the year. Obviously, mm -hmm. those end of the year. Um, championships are kind of tied up as far as the major races for them. And this is sort of that uh, last chance to get involved in a stakes race, get some black type on the uh, on the sheet for these horses and, and a great spot, I think, for her to return uh, after not being seen since kind of a disappointing effort in the Kentucky Oaks as she was undefeated prior to that. And I think that's something that we kind of forget because we've seen so much from this division going forwards with Nest yeah. and uh, obviously Secret Oath won the Kentucky Oaks and has run a lot since then and, you know, looked like she was ready to upset 
upset that distaff field for a second when we were there. And, and obviously uh, that did not end up happening as she couldn't hold on But after taking the lead in the stretch. Um, but I mean, I think the argument against Kathleen O for a lot of people was who has she really beat? And yeah. I don't disagree with that. But I look around at this field and I wonder who's really here. <laughs> That's a fair assessment. I think who's really here, who is some of these other horses beaten potentially other than themselves in different spots. I, I agree. I mean, Kathleen O ran that huge Gulfstream Park Oaks effort, 98 buyers. I mean, I think that's what got a lot of us excited. She's got that, to me, at least very alluring running style of just that one big sweeping move. She's just a push button horse in a lot of instances. Uh, and when she goes, see you later. I mean, now granted the, the Philly division down in Florida was not particularly strong last year. I do like that she actually broke her maiden over this track at Aqueduct. So she's not just a pure Florida horse. She's run at Aqueduct and she likes the ground there. Uh, and so I, I think that's a positive. But yeah, when you look through the rest of the field, I mean, it, it feels like a grade three. I mean, which is a little bit of a step down in some ways for Kathleen O, who was being mentioned with Nest and Secret Oath and Echo Zulu going into that Oaks as kind of the four primary potential challengers and contenders for the race. And she didn't run poorly. And I, you know, David made a note of that in the, in the racing forms, but, you know, stumbled out of the gate was 12th early and, and was 13 lengths back and, and made up a ton of ground, had to go super wide. Wasn't the greatest trip, but not that I think she could have maybe gotten a better one uh, considering the conditions, but still ended up finishing fifth in that race. But now coming off the long layoff, I mean, Shug McGahee on long layoffs is a little bit hit or miss sometimes. I mean, I know some of the trainer stats would say that he's good, but looking at dirt route layoffs, it's less effective. So I think there's some concern. Maybe the second time back is when Kathleen O is really going to pop. But you look at this other field, and I don't know, I'll go and kind of talk a little bit about the second choice, Nostalgic, on the morning line at 7-2. to two. This is a horse that I just feel like, that last effort at turn back the alarm kind of came out of nowhere. This is a horse that was running kind of mid-70, mid-80 buyer speed figures, and all of a sudden pops with a 95. This is also a horse that takes some time off, takes some breaks occasionally, and now is running for the second time in a month. And so I, I just, I'm worried about the turn back and I'm worried about whether or not she's going to be able to replicate that last experience. Um, I do kind of like, I mean, my dad mentioned 63 caliber. I think at a price, I actually kind of like 63 caliber a little bit. Uh, that's a horse that I think showed a little something, was able to beat Falconet last time out at that stakes race down at Churchill Downs uh, on that big day that Gunrunner had. Uh, I think that he was the fourth of the fifth Gunrunners that won that day. So uh, I think at an eight to one on the morning line, you're getting a little bit of value there with the Tom Amos horse. Well, I wonder about this one, who is a My Racehorse horse, um, if yeah. you are going to get that kind of price. Yeah. And if you are, um, I would be, I would understand, but I would be a little bit surprised. I think she might go a little bit lower. I don't think this will be the usual heavy, heavy favorites that they end up producing with all the money that they put into betting their horses. And I will admit, um, I have dabbled a little bit in some of My Racehorse purchases in the past. And I do have a couple shares in this one. And this is one of the very few that I've actually seen a profit return back to me off of the wins that she has been able to uh, produce. And so um, I'm rooting for her a little bit for My, my Racehorse wallet <laughs> to get some of those uh, percentages of the purse in here. Um, yeah, I mean, she's super consistent. She's won four times in her six lifetime starts. I feel like she's never really run a bad race. I do just think that this field is a little bit tougher. Um, but I, I, I feel like I think this field is tougher because of Kathleen O and I don't necessarily think it's tougher because of anyone else. Um, a horse like nostalgic who you mentioned with that big fig last time, um, that was behind battle bling, who is a horse that was able to defeat coach. Um, and coach was one that was coming back for Brad Cox. And so I think people were sort of validating, uh, battle bling winning over coach last time because she did come back to win again in such a, uh, and, and improve this figure. But Coach was nowhere um, yeah. last time out at Churchill over the weekend at the in the Chaluki, and she was a short price in there. So I kind of went into the Chaluki thinking, man, Coach, she's kind of nothing, and I don't really think that she's that good, and she had never been successful versus graded stakes company. Mm -hmm. So the fact that she got beat by another horse wasn't that surprising to me, and that that one came back to win. It only makes me really want to downgrade Nostalgic, especially at a short price. 
With Morning Matcha, I think that's kind of the other one that people might gravitate towards because she was second in the cotillion, but that was a track that day at Parks that was playing so kindly to inside speed, and she was inside. And we saw society come back, and, and a lot of people were um, interested in her in the distaff as a potential wise guy kind of horse. And I, I know I was there, and I was like, Matthew... <laughs> this is not one of your better opinions. No, well, I, um, we both like Clarier, and and by we nose, we were almost right. Uh, but yes, uh, yeah. yeah, it was. Yeah, you weren't the only one that was uh, seduced a little bit by that race, though. Yeah. And, and and as someone who's been seduced by many uh, many races in the past to take horses in the future at uh, at short prices, believe me, I get it. Um, but I definitely don't want Morning Match in here because I think she kind of had um, a lot to her benefit last time out. And again, facing company that I don't really think much of going forward. Falconet also going to take money. Irad Ortiz, Todd Pletcher, lightly mm -hmm. raced. Uh, but again, second to 63 caliber last time and 63 caliber might be the bigger price. You go to the eight tizzy in the sky, making her stakes debut um, has dramatically improved since switching over to the Jose Camejo barn, but would also need to improve going into a spot like this. And I think both her and Falconet are going to be the ones showing some early speed. I don't really think Scratch Cat is that good, although she is consistently running those uh, lower 80 buyer speed figures. Mm -hmm. So if you like the consistency, at least there is that, but it's still not consistently fast enough for a field like this. And then we have the one left, who is a horse that your dad mentioned as a price play, um, improving with distance significantly last time out, but that was also a sloppy track and is shipping in from parks. So I look around at this field uh, to sum up and I'm like, man, I don't really like anybody. If Kathleen O is the horse that she used to be, she yeah. should win here. I agree with that. If she's the horse she used to be, if she's the horse we saw at Gulfstream over the summer or over the spring, I should say, she absolutely should beat this field um the other consideration in this race that i, I kind of looked at was the pace setup so the one is probably going to have to go from the inside rail and has speed and then it comes down to the ortiz brothers and what they decide to do on the outside uh between the seven and the eight falconet and tizzy in the sky because they both are speed horses and there's a question of you know i know sometimes people go well i rad and, or and jose don't burn each other's horses out Although I, I watched the Ogden Phipps when Jose and Irad burned each other's horses out uh, in a big spot with Latruska and search results. So, you know, I, I think that, you know, what they decide to do, how hard they decide to send, where they decide to place, because Todd Pletcher said in an interview this week that Falconet, I mean, he didn't totally discount the idea of Falconet coming from off the pace, but basically said this horse is being trained forwardly and this horse is meant to be on the lead. Uh, so is Irad going to get to the lead at, at all costs? you know, what sort of pace is that going to set up? And again, that sets up beautifully for Kathleen O uh, to make that one big move as everybody else is getting wiped out by an early uh, pace. So uh, I just think there's a lot going on there that I really like. 63 caliber, I think will sit a good trip. I think he'll, she'll sit behind some of that speed uh, and should sit nicely. So I kind of like a Kathleen O 63 caliber exact to uh, get a little bit of value. Although you're right with my racehorse, uh, there is a there was a horse I have a very small share in that debuted at Gulfstream Park. I think the morning line was eight to five, went off at one to five, like she was secretariat. Uh, so you know you always have to be concerned about what value you're actually going to get from post time on those types of horses. But uh, with with Kathleen O in the race, I mean she's obviously going to attract a lot of money. Horses like Morning Matcha and Nostalgic have reputations, and people are going to put money on. So hopefully you get maybe five to one on a horse like sixty three caliber, and that would be I think at least a halfway decent price on a horse that I think is going to run well in the spot. I'm with you there and, and I'll be rooting for her a little bit as a, a, one of many owners um, myself as well. Um, now, you know how when a trainer has a horse in a race that they have to pick their horse when they're handicapping. Mm -hmm. I'm so grateful that when you own a teeny tiny piece of a horse, you don't have to pick them <laughs> for every single race they run in because sometimes it's just not how, uh, how you see things. Yeah. No, you have to you have to stay uh, very objective here, uh, and uh, you know I, I like sixty three caliber. I like my gun runners, um, but uh, you know I think this is just this is a tough spot. And I think it's interesting, maybe a little bit similar to the Long Island, just to maybe tie these two races together with a little bit of a narrative. Is I feel like you're going to find something out about these horses in these two races. I think 
we're going to find out potentially if there is some separation between those Chad Brown horses in the Long Island. You know, David had them, you know, five to two, five to two, three to one, basically throw a blanket over the three of them. They're about the same. Well, let's see how they end up running. Let's see who, uh, you know, we both like uh, the four to kind of assert herself a little bit in that spot. But, you know, same sort of thing here. I think we'll find out is nostalgia, can nostalgia back up that 95 speed figure from last time out? Is uh, Kathleen O back? you know, and, and ready to really compete in the distaff division with Nest and Secret Oath and Clarier next year. And then, you know, looking at uh, a horse like 63 Caliber, is that a horse that's ready to take that next step or Falconet ready to take that next step? So it'll be a, a fun way to close out the year to see where these horses are and project them uh, next year in, a, in the always exciting distaff division. So I'm always excited for uh, this division. I think it's the best one going right now in horse racing. So uh, always excited to see some new potential names pop up onto the map. Right. I think everybody's really focused on uh, prepping for that road to the Kentucky Derby coming up um, because we will see some of those prep races very early on next year. And everybody always gets excited about the next um, best three-year-old male. But I think in a way, too, it's a great way to phrase it as a preview, um, a little sneak peek into who could possibly be um, a decent four-year-old that we have coming next year? And if somebody has a serious breakout performance in a race like this, or we or we really see Kathleen O um, show us kind of what she did earlier on in her season and, and take another step forward perhaps as well, um, I know that people will still kind of question the company but it, it would be nice to possibly see a horse like this as a, as a serious contender for next year, um, because I think that all of the stars of a lot of the divisions that we have seen this year are, are on to the next phase of their careers. And so um, as, as we are in racing, we're always looking for what's next. Absolutely. Now, I couldn't say it better myself. I was talking to someone the other day and said, being a fan of horse racing is like being the fan of a double A baseball team. Now, you know, the guys get called up and within the next year, they move to the next level and, and you don't see them and you just have to get used to the new names uh, and new figures that come in. And, uh, you know, it's it, uh, an element of that is exciting because there's always kind of the unknown that is coming up. You mentioned the Oaks preps and things like that. And there are horses that we haven't even heard about yet that are going to make an impression on the Oaks and, and Derby trail uh, coming up here next year. So it is exciting though, to see that more senior and adult division get replenished a little bit. Uh, and hopefully this, these are two races that do that both on the turf and on the dirt. All right. Well, thanks as always for taking the time to uh, talk about these races with me. And hopefully, unlike last year, we can give out a winner for one of these. But but either way, uh, I feel like last year there was some valuable information to be gleaned. And, and that's kind of the point of why we do what we do. Maybe you don't agree with the picks. Maybe they don't win. But maybe there's an angle or an analysis or a way of getting there that helps in the future. And that's that's why we do what we do. Absolutely. No, it's always great talking to you, Sarah, and I really appreciate you having me on. And it was, it's been a really fun year to get to know you, to get to know all the folks at HRN and just to get to know more and more people in the horse racing industry. So uh, thank you for having me on. Always a blast and have a wonderful, safe and happy Thanksgiving and holiday season to you and all the listeners out there. Absolutely. Happy Thanksgiving to everybody and happy Thanksgiving to your family and, and tell your dad that I, I'm rooting for his picks. <laughs> I'll let him know. All right, that's Matthew DeSantis. I'm Sarah Obadwe from Horse Racing Nation. Thanks for tuning in and good luck.